Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's Brad reaching out to you again, saying hi. Um, today is a two-part piece in regards to truly building a sound rig for mining. Now, understand, I do mine, but I mine because I want to understand the principles of the electronics involved in the equation. Being a, a senior data center administrator slash migrator and so on, I look at these things and I need to master them in a capacity so that if I come across a GPU cluster, which is what we're looking at here, I can do so. Uh, so let me jump into this and we'll begin. As you can see, all of this gear here, ranging from a very good, strong power supply rated truly by its wattage, not by superfluous natured wording, as you can see out there. I went for the RAID Max solution for having a fairly flexible, very uh, capable power supply to provide for this particular design case with a single power supply input for the PSU, a all-encompassing strong solution for working with GPU mining. Now, over here, I have my tools, the screwdrivers, you know, my meter in case I need it, um, screws of an assortment, which we all accumulate over the years. And over here, I have a recycled motherboard, which is a pretty strong ASUS class motherboard. Uh, but really, you know, as you can see here, the P5K3 Deluxe is what I'm using here. I do recommend that you kind of go for a little bit newer chipset so that you don't have the difficulties that you will have with the USCP XP1 uh, interface for the PCIe. Now, um, with this model, with the cards, and with the GPU rigging such as this 4 to 1 single USB interface, you have to do something first. Believe it or not, everything you see here must be frozen work-wise until you start with this. You got it, it's a thermostat. It basically checks the temperature of things and I'll explain very shortly what I mean by this. So, I have to take a big step backwards as I begin looking at this and I have to realize the nature along with my cup of coffee that I have to make some very important decisions within the location I'm staging this in. So stand by for a second while we move to a different location. As you can see now, what we've done is we've moved into a couple of areas. And here you see what is called an open rack design that allows me to test combinations of video cards. There, 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 and so on. And of course, home base, my rack. But you may not have a rack. So you have to make the decision first. Where is the best place to stage this gear? outside of a shed, outside of your property. Well, believe it or not, using your trusty thermostat, we aim down at the floor in the basement and we can see information pertaining to location. Then what you do is you'll take a shot in the ceiling to gauge the temperature difference. Now you do this over and over and over throughout your house and you can also hit surface areas uh, such as the outer walls and you can delineate from down here we have a temperature of 64 degrees and up here we have a temperature of almost 69 degrees and that five degree difference is referring to something that's very important that a lot of people make the mistake of doing and that is figuring out what your convection level is going to be. Now convection means the movement of heat to cold and cold to heat. It's a circular pattern we know it as a rotational pattern or a vortex and this is created naturally uh, in earth in regards to uh, everything from water as well as above earth as in the atmosphere such as tornadoes and so on hot and cold can drive each other to a very powerful force the second thing is how you want to build out your rack so in here I have an open rack which is a very common open rack but I've made one crucial detail about the open rack is that I want to make sure that I'm using conductive constructs for my framing opposed to insulated constructs i.e. wood so that I have what the video card itself needs 
and that is proper distributed surface area for grounding. Now, what that basically comes down to is the power supplies out of shell housing can create a pathway for grounding. And everything screwed into a PC case along with the enclosement of the case keeps both the RF under control and it provides a pathway for grounding. Because as you can see, these screws here are interlocked with the metal of the frame. Wood is okay. It's an insulator. You know, it's it has some functionalities. You can use it for a lot of things. But the one bad thing about it, especially when you're dealing with heat, is the nature of these cards and the voltage load, which can produce genuine fire. So, um, you know, wood is a poor conductor. Uh, it can isolate, but it does eliminate the pathways on groundings, and you can't always trust what you see availability-wise for what you've got out there because this is an interconnected setup. So if you want to take a shelf, a metal shelf, and you want to suspend your cards from above and use a platform on the bottom for your motherboard and you're, in, you're interchanging 10 or 15 cards a year, absolutely get a shelf, do it that way, don't contain it, don't go for you like I am. You know, that's, you know, that's volume and mass. And uh, you can use 4U chassis in regards to that just to do the housing and the USB connectivity. But this is a more flexible model. But it does have its limitations. When you have an open encasement like this, your convection, may it be the heat from your CPU and so on and so on, is diffuse. In other words, it gets spread out. Okay. Um, when you funnel and control how the heat moves through, you actually have a better return on the convection effect and the heat effect of your power supplies, fans, and so on, as you can see here and here and so on. In this model, that's not the case. These heat sinks are sitting out in the open. They're doing what they're doing, and uh, they have what we call little hot pocket zones. When you have a system that is contain blowing from the front to the back, you don't. There are no possibilities of those hot pocket zones creating even a higher convection effect by well-controlled airflow. And as you can see, even though I have these spinning fans here, they're still, I can feel it right here. I can feel dead pockets of air. And by feeling that dead pocket of air, those are points of convection effect. Um, for data centers like in guys like me, that's super important because you're dealing with a lot of gear in a confined sense and a confined space. So be very careful here when you're doing that. Now, I have racks. Uh, you can make them. Uh, they're just basically L frames. Or you can buy basic frames. Or you can go another pathway. But as you can see here, I have a genuine full bore, right line, advantage style, rack enclosure and I have an HP rack, rack enclosure and I've opened them up so that I can take full convection effect of this very cool area. So as a recap, go through your house, pencil and paper, hit the, hit the floor, hit the wall, hit the ceiling and see what the temperature differences are. If you've got a five degree variance or higher, that's where you want to go. So the floor has got to be the coolest because it's moving cold air up to the front or to the area of your mining. Putting your racks at mid-level or high level puts them closer to the hotter spot in your room. You really want to get them down low in a blank area like this spot right here. Let the cool air come in and then the hot air only is forced up the back area up to the area and then your HVAC unit may be a household HVAC such as your air conditioning heating unit or you actually have a genuine uh, platform out here like my um, Wynor. Um, very good unit, by the way. Um, it takes that hot air out and it reprocesses it, cools it, and jets it out, and then it moves back down to the floor. Hence, right back to your unit, and you've got a really nice, cool level, and you can really, really push your, your video cards that way. So, if you noticed, I stepped away from all of it so that I knew that I had the most optimal place in my property that could do the work. Secondly, good power. Excellent conditioner strips, very important. They don't have to be UPSs because these are mining machines. They can just get power back and they can start right back up. So don't invest a lot of money into that. Just get a PC rated surge strip. And I got this one for $5 right here. And it was uh, a great 
you know, old style data center, uh, 20 amp load unit, and I can do quite a bit with it, but you could just use a basic $10 PC rated surge strip with conditioner mode in it to provide you the necessary protection for this. And believe it or not, what you see right here is all running on just a 400 power, a, 400, a 460 watt power supply here, down here. So the one I've got over on the other side is much more capable and I'm still cranking away with this guy with no issues whatsoever. So stand by for a second and we'll go back to our, our staging area and we'll start prepping some crucial details. Okay, so we're back into the general construction area. And like I said, we've got parts and pieces over here and we've got ourselves the component sections here, tools, power supply, placement, and of course our extenders and other components that are crucial to dealing with what we're trying to do here. Now, by default, people make the mistake of thinking, okay, I can take my, you know, my motherboard, you know, put it in, sorry. Sorry about that. And all I'm doing right now is just kind of giving you a point of reference on this. But basically what we're doing here is we're just going to thumbprint this case. By thumbprinting the case, it gives us an indication of how well things are going to fit. Um, right now I'm using what is a test card. It's just a 550, but it has the footprint of most of the standard cards that I have in other machines, which I will transplant later into the environment. Now, then we have also the four slot. And this guy is a problem uh, because the problem with the four slot is you got to make sure that you've got a good enough motherboard. In other words, a fairly newer motherboard, in my opinion, that will allow you to be able to uh, accomplish what you're wanting to do. Now, with that issue being the case, motherboards such as this um, P5K7 series uh, have to be reviewed and to make sure that they're going to accomplish what needs to be done. And if they can't accomplish what needs to be done, don't use the motherboard. And yes, it's important to understand that uh, motherboards are not all created equally. Um, so with that being the case, and you begin to kind of get a model of what you're doing, you start to realize the case itself is important. Now this case you see here is a prototype case. Um, it has more, a little bit more flexibility on the front side sectional and the midsectional versus the back sectional. Plus it's also well designed. The only concern that I do have with it is the nature of the coating on the shelf. Now that can, that can cost you a degree or two, but if you have addendum ventilation in these areas for sparing out that capacity, then a sheen on a case is okay. Usually I prefer bare metal, bare aluminum with as little as much possible plastic coating because those are insulators and it does matter. So when you're dealing with, let's say a, a, a DL3, 380 or something like that, and they'll actually paint the metal completely to make sure that the heat can't go anywhere else. So it can't transfer from inside to the outside. Because you got to remember, your room, every piece of metal, everything actually, not just metal, wood, plastics, and so on, will hold heat like a battery. So it's important that you want to make sure that if you do have heat, that it's all going out the back here, and or it's coated so that it's not coming out the sides and it's not coming out the front and there is a coated front on the front and so on anodized does work okay you know if you have anodized aluminum cases those do somewhat better but in the general sense of things you know a good case that really has no overhead on it like you see here um will get you to where you need to be couple couple that with a really good uh distributed power supply then this turns into something pretty legitimately nice. Now, this motherboard here is just a fitting motherboard because I do know that this motherboard does have problems with the version two, version three uh, interface cards. 
And in this particular case, this is, it's in without its bracket, but it does have a bracket sitting over there. But um, this is the type class connector for the one to four, which is right there, as you can see. And, um, you know, it, does, it gives a real heartburn for this motherboard. And the principal reason why it's giving its heartburn is the PCIe lanes. You see here, you have you know, one, a one, a 16, and a eight with a 16 edge connector. And then you have multiple PCI slots. Now, these are being shared, so it's either this or this. And over here, it's either this, this, or this. Only this bus is actually an independent PCI bus lane. These two guys here are also independent lanes, but that only gives me one, two, three, four, and then five. So putting multiple cards in here can very quickly turn south on you if you're not prepared for it. And because the newer card setups prefer PCIe 3, uh, some of the 2s, like the, the uh, Series 250s chipsets, uh, they do function uh, decently. Some do come up, some don't. But in this case, I'm only using this guy as a fitter for now because the actual motherboard, which I actually purchased, is sitting in another case housing to be a transfer. So at that point in stage, um, this will basically be done here as a fitting process to allow us to get the cards into where we want them to be and just do some spacing. Now, the last part of this particular video is to explain to you uh, all the things that you don't get right. Um, let me explain that to you because so that way it makes better sense. 90% um, of your headaches in regards to dealing with finalizing your chassis are going to be related to the pair of Molex and cabling. In other words, the USB class connectors, uh, the card connectors, and if you look on the actual interfaces, may they be single bus or may they be four bus like this, you know, there are four Molex connectors there and one USB 3.0 to power this unit, just this unit alone. So what you don't have, obviously, are the Molex cables. So that's an important detail that you should stop at this point stage, which, which we'll do with this video. We're going to stop here at this stage. And you pre-template everything so you can do two critical things. One, identify the cables you need. Because some video cards have six and some have four Molex interfaces on the cards themselves. That's basically you know something that would reside right here. This one has six. Others may have four, um, eight and you need to count them up. Um, it's not going to be uncommon that you have, you know, four 1070s and three of them are eight Molex interfaces and the other, the other last one is a six. They'll still process. They just work on a different voltage load, but you need to get them. And then the second part is once you've identified those and how they're going to hook up to power, you have to measure your space out so you, you get the right kind of cabling. The end result is you got a horrible mess. You have these cables that are everywhere and airflow is being messed up with and to a certain degree. So to help with that, you know, consider this idea. Your power supply is sitting here. Uh, you have a travel pathway here and you can use uh, secure tabs along this way to secure the bulk of the cables heading up on this upper ridge over down through and to the power supply. Now, keeping the power, those, those cable Molex splice sets are crucial in that regard because uh, using a pluggable set power supply like this one, which actually has sockets in it that allow you to plug in specific type of connectors, and then you just go up to Rain, Raid Max and you order more of the cables that you want so that you have enough outputs for this. Now, this chassis will do up to eight interfaces so yeah one two three four five six seven eight so i know that i'm going to have to have eight fours or uh, sorry eight, eight eights or at least eight eights with a couple of spare sixes uh the general power supply case box will not give you that many so just simply go out and ask for them and if you can truly run the cables up and under and over and directly into the video cards as they go using the actual RAID Max uh, extended power cables, 
then you're in great shape. If not, you can go to New Egg or Cyber Guys and actually get the Molex converters to the point where you need them to be. Now also remember that uh, not everything is Molex. It could be SATA power outputs, which are the black heads. Um, you know, in this case, this is Molex right here, just like the fans. That's a Molex connector right there. Uh, and then you have, of course, the SATA type interface, which in regards hooks up to hard drives and uh, CD-ROM drives, but also are a source of power. And so their edge connector will look, you know, like that, this big long one right here. Now, um, you do that based on what you need. And then that leaves you now with, okay, if, once I get the measurements done and I counted all of my cables up, and I could start putting boards in, which you can. Uh, the next challenge is the operating environment. What are you going to use? Are you going to use a simple storage OS? Um, are you going to use Windows 10? Windows 10 does have a problem with more than eight cards. Uh, but in this case, this chassis can do eight cards. And that shouldn't be a challenge. Now, a lot of people will tell you, use USB. Well, I disagree. To use a USB boot drive on a motherboard like this gives some issues. Um, first things first, you're really taking a crap shot using the type class interface on the back and you have a dongle that hangs off the back of the unit. That not naturally is a real problem because if you do damage these ports, you run the risk of frying the entire motherboard. Uh, secondly, SSD storage like this very well rated GX2 series 128 gig module cost me 20 bucks if i went out and bought myself a usb drive uh to you know let's say usb 3.0 connected up to one of these interfaces here that actually is not the same thing as this and the quality of usb drives have driven to the problem of them just simply dying well you'll probably say no big deal i've got a clone image of it i'll put another drive in so on and so on and so on and so on that's great but in the world that i live in uh, I use a little bit of quality, not a lot. They cost the same. The overhead is a lot less. And I have a longevity of three years. Right there, three years. And you can rate them if you want, but I wouldn't. I think just a simple, low-dollar SATA drive, 3D NANSAT, which is uh, you know a good but overall basic performance SSD drive to accomplish everything that needs to be done. And the security is 100%. You know, they're going to have to really bust in here to get their hands on this, opposed to you simply messing with you by pulling the OS drive out of the back. Uh, it has happened. I have watched it happen several times with what we call key dongles and um, microchip dongles that are used for high-end Oracle and other products, SAP, HANA, and so on, where we might incur with an application a need to run it, you know, run something that's fairly important and functional. Um, and they have a key dongle in the back, and then somebody just because it happens breaks it off. So this is basically part one of part two. Um, part two will be coming in a few weeks. I have to do my own measurements. This is a new design. This is a prototype case design. I will send you the link in the Facebook, sorry, in the YouTube uh, subtitle section where you can see the design of it, and it is a good case. I the only th only potential conflict I've had so far is, do I want two power supplies? And the answer to me is, no, I don't. Because eight CPUs, if you do it right, is enough. And uh, it is for fun, too. So, I'm, you know, I'm doing this in a professional sense, but at the same point in time, very cheap. All of this stuff you see here is cheap. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to sign off now. And in a few weeks, you'll see part two, and you'll see how this will all come together. I'm even debating about my fans here. I think I'm just going to do a central fan and then two primaries on the back here. All right, here. These are 80s. These are 120s. But uh, with that being said, they're just movers because if I do this right, those front fans are going to do most of my work for me. And all the heat blows out the back at a rapid pace, keeping those units so cool, not even their CPU fans, correction, their GPU fans will engage. And that's doing it right. All right, I'll let you guys go. Take care and look for part two.